in a Chris era, it is on the November 8th, 2000, year, <coughs> in the year 2000, the Wednesday at 4 p.m. at Panitarama Forest Center, Sierra would like to start his teaching both for the local yogis as well the yogis from abroad. Only today, Sierra will start to teach the Satipatthana Dhamma practice and Sarah will give the discourse today. So as a gift now, Sarah will give a Dhamma as uh, both in the practical field as well in theory. Sarah explains all the beings when mentioned as all the beings, human beings are also included. So as for all the human beings, all like to be prosperous. So if they want sukha or prosperity, then not only they lack prosperity, we all hate dukkha or suffering. Everybody are disgusted with suffering. So when Sarah says, when we come to explain about sukha, or prosperity, then if we if one have to explain the real meaning, it is a white subject. But in a summary or in short, if what kind of happiness or prosperity we would like. So that is we need to differentiate. That is by pursuing any kind of prosperity, is there any guarantee present or absent, or if there is any prosperity that is dangerously good to you, or is that freed from any danger. So for any kind of prosperity or sukha or happiness, if it is dangerously good to you, then is that kind of dangerously good pleasure or have this happiness, is there any guarantee or not? It is very difficult for one to differentiate. So as all the human beings, we all belong to this karmic world or sensual planes. As we all are the beings in the sensual planes, naturally we all will like all the sensual objects. These sensual objects are from the sense of seeing, hearing, smell, taste, touch, etc. So all these belong to karma or sensual pleasures. But, and Sarah explained, majority of the people on this world would like these sensual pleasures. These, in terms as Pali, is called karma sukha. Karma sukha means all the sensual uh, sensations. So as for all the sensual sensations, karma, when it comes, it are categorized in two parts. The first one is called vittu karma. It belongs to the material, all the sensual object from outside. And second is kilesa karma. Kilesa karma is the um, sensual or longing or lust from our mind. So whenever we meet with any sensual object, we want it, we like it, we crave for it. So, for example, from seeing any kind of sensual object which is attractable, which is attractive, which is beautiful, which is adorable, then we already like it. Or from the sense of hearing too, when we hurt, any sweet voices, or the sweet voices from the opposite beings, or the soft sounds, we also like it. Likewise, whenever we smell, we like to have good smell, sweet smell, etc. And for the sense of touch too, not only we like to have a good sensation from touch, we like to have touch with the opposite beings. So whenever we meet with any desirable, any sense object from outside, from our mind, we like it, we crave for it. So 
This is called Kilesa Kama. So we all, whenever we come to see sensual object, hear, smell, or taste, or in come to touch, we like from our mind. So this is called Kilesa Kama. And in that manner, we have to understand or keep in our mind that there are two types of Kama. Most of the people on this world, we all succumb to Kilesa Kama. That is the craving or lust from our mind. So whenever this craving or lust in our mind comes to contact with any kind of Vitu Kama, that is the sensual object from outside. So whenever we meet with any sensual object from outside, then we are satisfied or we like it. So when these two comes together, we thought this is the best of pleasures in this world. So Sarah explained, not only the human beings succumb to this craving, but also the animals also like it. That is, from the huge animal beings to the small insects which cannot be seen from our eyes, they also like, they also succumb to Kilesa Kama. So that's why Sarah explained all the Satawa or all the beings, whenever we meet with sensual object from seeing, hearing, smell, touch, etc., then we, we are staying in with Kama Sukha or sensual pleasures. Hey, Kama Sukha, go away. The Boa Kitty, a Kaita Lipa. The Kate Chanda looked at my middle, and I never changed going middle. Eddie Chanda never. I'm not going to be seated. Busy, I'm going to Chanda never. The long going to Chanda never. The Boa PB got out of it. For all the beings in one lifetime, they are enjoying on Kama Sukha or the sensual pleasures uh, during the lifetime. So they, they uh, enjoy the sensual pleasures, which is dangerously good to them, which is deadly good to them, and in the end they succumb to this and they have come to the end of one lifetime. ตามมาลูกได้ก็เอริชาลาเนี่ยเว้ยเชิงว่าเอริชาลาอเมตันโดเดเวทเทปะเอกุเดมาลายอบีโดอัตุจาเรปีเดนทีบะก็ยอกี
when the yogis who come to this place, they have to abandon or they have to leave behind all these sensual pleasures. So, um, as they are spending 60 days to practice in this meditation, uh, they have they have to lose all these sensual pleasures. So, after abandoning for the meantime for 60 days, one needs to ask oneself, why, why to assess oneself. So, why we are taking up this Dhamma practice is, is there any point which is better or superior than to any kind of karma, sukha or sensual pleasures? We need to ask ourselves or oneself. After one have abandoned karma, sukha or sensual pleasures, once we entered this place and if we are following this practice methodically or systematically, then it, we would achieve a kind of pleasantness or the sukha that is incomparable to karma sukha. So that's why it is called as nekama prikaha. Nekama prikaha. So for the sensual pleasures, these have no guarantee. They are dangerously good and deadly good. So after we have abandoned those uh, sensual pleasures which are dang- danger to us, then we are entering to a kind of sukha which is incomparable to karma sukha. When one achieves nikama sukha or the happiness that is freed from all the dangers, to, that is free from all the dangers. To attain this sukha or the happiness, we need to practice systematically and methodically. That is called as samma bhutipati. To practice systematically as we are told. As we are told. For all the beings, when we are going to take up the systematic or systematic practice, then there are opposing nature in ourself. For example, like raga, that is loss or craving. For example, like hatred. For example, like delusions. As these are the dirts or swelling in our mind, when we are going to take up this samapatipati, straightforward practice systematically, then these come to oppose in one's mind and this is natural. All the beings from one lifetime after another, these defilements are seated in us or the embryo inside of the being is it is built in one one lifetime after another. So as it is a very strong force in ourselves, then at times we crave for one or we crave for anything. Or at times we have a hatred or anger, or at times we uh, uh, we cannot decide what it is. At times we are deluded. So in that way, our mind is always uh, overwhelmed with or strong, empowered with these dirts in our mind. So it is how it is dwell in a being is just like in a for a being. For one who has a bad smell, it is very hard to take off that bad smell in one. So in the same manner as for all the beings from one lifetime after another, as these dirts in our mind or the defilements in our mind are already dwell in it and very strong and it is very hard to eradicate. So how it is hard, Shara gave an example like, when a big elephant, when it became wild, he is out of control. And it is very difficult for that elephant to be tamed. So in the same manner as our mind always succumb to the power of these defilements, it is very difficult to control or tame our mind. Beings from one lifetime after another, 
They don't know how to control the bodily behavior and verbal behavior, and they don't know the method how to tame the mind as well. So, in this manner, from one life after time after another, as we are succumb or always empowered by the defilements in our mind, it is like we have to bow to these defilements from one lifetime after another. So that's why, as they are very strong in nature, whenever we see an adorable object, instantly we crave for it. Whenever we heard a melodious sound, we like it very much. So in that way, whatever the object is adorable, we like it. That means we succumb to the power of these defilements. So this is somewhat like um, an elephant who became wild and who who is hard to control and it is very difficult to tame. So in the same manner as for the human beings do, whenever we meet any adorable object to be seen, then we already crave for it. And whenever a thing or sound, we heard it or we see it, we hate it instantly. So in the same manner, there would be conceit envy, jealousy, etc., all the defilements are uh, coloring or empowering in our mind. So to, how to eradicate or how to take the upper hand on these defilements is if we don't know the method, then we will come to the end of our life in the same manner. So what we are meeting, we are losing for one lifetime again. So that's why Sarah explains to come to know the truism or understand the truth of the Dhamma, then we have to practice it systematically. If not, it is very difficult to understand all the truths of nature. So in accordance with Buddha's literature, Sarah explains as we will gain or we will benefit from losing it. So, Sarah explained in a Pali phrase, that is, however the Dhamma nature are very difficult to be seen, or however deep it may be, but if we are able to eradicate the opposing nature, these opposing nature are, after all, the Niwarana or the hindrances. If we are able to eradicate all the hindrances, then, because of no covering up of these hindrances, we will come to understand all the truths of nature. How we will come to understand the truth of nature is, as we are in the field of practice, we will come to understand these and these are the real suffering. So, this is the way to practice. And by trotting this path of this suffering, uh, the path to free the suffering, one will reach to the sensation of suffering. So in that way, you will come to see the true of the Dhamma nature. Why we cannot see now is, it is like an object is covered by something. If there is a cover on an object, we cannot see what is underneath. So however the Dhamma nature is deep and difficult to understand, if we can eradicate or upheave or, or if we can eradicate these Niwarana or hindrances, then if these opposing hindrances are freed in our mind, then we will come to understand the truism of the Dhamma nature. As explained, when one is able to eradicate all the opposing Dhamma nature, however the deep, the truism of the Dhamma nature, then one would be able to uh, see the truism of the Dhamma. So at this point, Sarah says, how it is connected, in which way we are going to learn or see the truism of the Dhamma. That is, if we are able to eradicate the opposing nature, 
the opposing nature like raga, that is lust or greed, all these are called uh, kamis sanda. Uh, these are the, this is one of the hindrance of sensual pleasures. So we are craving, as long as we are crave to these sensual pleasures, we cannot eradicate all these hindrances. Once we are able to eradicate these kamis sanda, then we are freed from the coloring of these sensual uh, from our mind. If we are able to eradicate these kamisana, then we must practice methodically or systematically. How it is connected mean, Sarah explained that to come to see the truism of the Dhamma, the connected path or the nature is to practice this Dhamma practice accordingly. That is the way it is connected. So if we are not practicing methodically, then we cannot eradicate these hindrances. If we cannot eradicate these hindrances, we cannot see the in-depth nature of these dhamma. But if we are able to eradicate, then we are free from the power and we will be seeing the dhamma nature. If one practice methodically and practicing so, then you should have a right answer. So to have this right answer, we need to eradicate all the opposing nature. To, to eradicate the opposing nature, we need to practice methodically or honestly, then we are able to practice accordingly. So it is somewhat like Sarah explained as a sick person. If somebody is ill or sick, then he needs to obey to the instructions of the doctors, or he has to listen as shown in the pamphlet of the medicine. Otherwise, he cannot be cured. So likewise, if we want to eradicate all these opposing demand nature, or the harmful nature, then it is very important for one to listen to the noble teaching, that which is the right method. We need to listen and to practice. When one takes up the right method or the right practice, then one needs to obey to the method that is hand handed down by the teacher. So we have to believe or have faith in the teacher that this is the right method. You have to accept it as a teacher. And after accepting this method, then you need to confirm this is the way as it should be. Then later on, you will come to a final decision that it is true. So in that way, we have to accept it, confirm, and we have to come to a decision. That's why it is important to listen to the teaching of the right method. The teaching of the right method was taught by our Lord Buddha. So, if we have faith to the Lord Buddha, and if we adore it, then we come to understand to the true nature of the Dhamma. So, Syara says, he is not forcing anybody to have faith in Buddha or in Dhamma, but with your, it is not a blind faith, but with your own uh, intellect, you need to have faith. If that faith is just 50-50 also, it is not good enough. We should have faith uh, wholeheartedly. As long as it is not a blind faith, it is good. So, to come to understand this, Buddha have taught us what are the seven... <coughs> sorry. What are the seven benefits we would achieve after practicing Satipatthana? So, if we do have belief and faith in the Dhamma as well in the Buddha, then we will come to see the truism of the Dhamma nature, however deep it may be, or however high esteem it may be. But Sarah explained, if we do not have any faith 
or belief in Buddha as well in Dhamma, then we are not sure of ourselves. We are not sure what we are doing. If we are not sure of oneself, if one is not sure of oneself, then we don't want to listen attentively. If we cannot listen attentively, how are we going to understand the true teaching of this method? If we are not understanding the true teaching of this method, how are we going to practice methodically? If we cannot practice methodically, then all the while our mind will succumb to all the opposing, opposing or the covering up nature in our mind. So, if we cannot oppose or eradicate all these demand, opposing or opposite demand nature, how are we able to realize the high esteem nature of the Dhamma? Although we may have faith in the Dhamma, but when it comes to practice, there are important facts are also included. These are, we need to have respect on this Dhamma practice. Not only to have due respect, we must practice it continuously and attentively. Only with due respect, with continuous and attentive practice, then at one time we are seeing this deep or high esteem Dhamma nature. If not, then we cannot see the high esteem Dhamma nature. So, as for the yogis in this center now, as an ordinary people, for the meantime we have left all the sensual pleasures. So, although we are in this center, if we cannot practice attentively and with due respect, we cannot achieve Nekama Sukha as well. That is the incomparable happiness we will attain through this practice. So in that way, we will be losing both ways. So as for a yogi who have abandoned the sensual pleasures for the meantime, if we do have faith, if we are practicing with due attentiveness, if we are practicing with respect to the to the method, to the Dhamma nature, and if we are practicing continuously, then we will be achieving this Nekama Sukha within a Nekama Sukha within a short time. So, uh, if we are achieving through our direct experience, then we become more interested in this, more interest in this Dhamma practice. So as we are, we are taking more interest in this Dhamma practice, in the end you sure would achieve Ariya Mega Sukha and Ariya Pala Sukha. That is, you will surpass the mundane level. So once you have come to realize these Dhamma Sukha through your direct experience, you strongly have faith in the Dhamma. So once you have faith through in the Dhamma, there is no need to ask anybody because through your direct experience, as you have faith in Dhamma, as spontaneously you do have faith in Buddha as well to the teachers or the Sangha. So on one hand, as, you, as we have to leave this Kama Sukha for the meantime. On the other hand, we have to aim to achieve Nikama, Nikama Sukha. So, in this Dhamma practice, Syara says, if we are noting or practicing this Satipatthana Dhamma practice with due respect, with due attentiveness, and noting continuously, then you will attain the Dhamma uh, prosperity within a short time. So, as Sarah have come to the end of this today's preaching, Sarah bless to all the yogis that may you all be able to practice this Dhamma diligently so as to achieve the Dhamma prosperity within a short time. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah.